Buenos días. Bueno, pues muy bienvenidos. Es un gran gusto estar con ustedes comenzando este congreso de, en celebración de los 75 años del Instituto de Matemáticas de la UNAM. Es un gran, realmente un gran honor y es un honor empezar con la conferencia del profesor Jack Milner, quien nos acompañó aquí en 1956 en un congreso que fue un parteaguas en la topología mundial y en la topología mexicana. Eh, qué bueno que nos acompañen, es un gran gusto y le cedo la palabra al doctor Alejandro Adem. Eh, muchas gracias, eh, para mí es un placer introducir al siguiente, al primer ponente de esta conferencia. Eh, yo fui estudiante aquí en la Facultad de Ciencias, recuerdo este, muchas sesiones aquí en este auditorio y en particular haber leído con mucho cuidado los trabajos del profesor Milnor, en particular su libro Clases Características con James Tashev, que es un libro clásico y ahora tenemos una versión en español que se va a presentar durante esta conferencia y a la salida del auditorio. Entonces, los este, conmino a que compren una copia porque es un libro increíble y a lo mejor el autor lo puede firmar, no, quién sabe. No? <laughs> It's a pleasure for me to introduce the first speaker of this conference. As I said, my introduction is going to be short because if ever there were a, a mathematician that does not require an introduction, it is John Milner. Uh, suffice it to say that he did uh, foundational and amazing work in algebraic and differential topology and in dynamical systems that opened the path to most of us here working in those areas uh, uh, to this day. He is one of the very few mathematicians that have won the Wolf Prize, the Field Medal, and the Abel Prize. So uh, let me now introduce uh, John Milner from Stony Brook University. Thank you. Testing, is that working? I think it would be easier if I stay okay, here. Sure. But uh, could you hand me the, ah, thank you. Well, I'm very happy to be here in Mexico once more. It's, uh, it's, UNAM has changed a great deal since I first visited here 61 years ago. Uh, it was a marvelous conference then, but uh, I hope that this will also be a marvelous conference. So let me just figure out what I'm doing. So first of all, just a brief outline of what I want to talk about. Uh, general problem is to understand the actions of a smooth group on a smooth manifold, and to study the quotient space. And I'll want to study two examples in particular. One is the uh, group of Mobius transformations of the Riemann sphere. It's the group of all holomorphic <coughs> maps from the Riemann sphere to itself, and that will act on the uh, space of div effective divisors on the Riemann sphere. So I'll explain more precisely soon, but just this is just a brief description of what the talk will be about, understanding the quotient space under this action. And the second, a much harder example, will be studying curves in the, projective, in the complex projective plane. And here, the automorphisms of the projective plane act on the space of curves, and we want to study the quotient space. So in both cases, some parts of the quotient spaces are beautiful objects to study, but other parts are rather nasty. And the basic problem I want to study is which, how, do, how can we understand which parts are which, which parts are good to study, and which parts are, uh, would be very awkward to work with. Well, st just to first start a kind of toy example to show, it'll illustrate the kind of problem that I want to talk about. So I look at the <coughs> additive group of real numbers acting on the real plane by... Uh, multiplying the first factor, x, by e to the t, and the second, uh, second component, y, by e to the minus t. So most, most orbits under this action are smooth curves. But uh, 
There's just one exceptional orbit, the origin, which is a fixed point of the action, and that is a bad point which will mess up the quotient topology. Because if you, so in the, in the quotient topology, we, look, we want to look at the space of orbits of this map. So each of these curves that you see on the screen will be identified to a point. And notice that, for example, that the positive x-axis is one point, will represent one point in the quotient space. And the origin would represent another point in the quotient space. <coughs> but this is very awkward since the, uh, the closure of the positive real axis contains the origin. So in the quotient space, we'd have an awkward situation in which the closure of one point contains another point. Well, here there's a simple rem remedy for getting rid of that problem. Just throw away the origin. So look at the punctured plane, and we can look at the, the uh, quotient space under the, this action where each of these curves gets identified to a point. And this is, will be a nice uh, smooth manifold locally. So if we take any point, let's see. Well, this is very hard to see, I guess. But if we take a point, say, on the x-axis or any point anywhere here and take a little transverse line, then each of the orbits through that line intersects at exactly once. So the quotient space there just looks like an interval on the real line. And this is true all around. So you might think that we're just getting a, a circle as the quotient space. But it's, things are not so nice because if you look at a, a little transverse on the positive real axis and the corresponding and the positive y axis, you'll find that every point on one uh, belongs to the same orbit as a point on the other. That is every point except off the axis itself. So this is an ex this quotient is an example of a space which is not Hausdorff. We have two distinct points, but every neighborhood of one intersects every neighborhood of the other. So this is the kind of thing that we may have to uh, worry about. We may have a quotient space which is locally Hausdorff, but not actually Hausdorff. But this, this is often enough to work with, because locally you can understand everything. And if you'll excuse me, I'm going to sit and tie my shoelaces before I trip. Okay, so first part, studying the space of divisors on the Riemann sphere. So by definition, the divisor is just a formal sum, or what's an element of the free additive group with one generator for each point on the Riemann sphere. So it's just a formal sum of points, each counted with some non-negative multiplicity. Well, the space of all such divisors has a very simple structure. It's just a complex projective and dimensional space. Because for any such divisor, you can think of it as a set of zeros of some homogeneous polynomial with n plus 1 complex coefficients. But notice that if we multiply the polynomial by a constant, the set of zeros won't change. So the uh, space we're looking at is just the quotient space non-zero points in an n-dimensional vector space over the complex numbers uh, where we identify points if they belong to the same line through the origin. So this is a nice compact space. We have a beautiful Lie group acting, group of Movius transformations. But the uh, quotient space is not so easy to study. Well. First, uh, now we have a, a uh, n-dimensional space here of divisors here. When I talk about dimension, I'll always mean dimension over the complex numbers. So we have an n-dimensional space, and acting on it, we have the group of Mobius transformations, which is a three-dimensional space. So in general, we'd expect to find a quotient space, which is n minus three-dimensional. but. Uh, 
Well, that, that's a good first approximation. Well, how do we distinguish? So there, it's a big, the quotient space is a big space. How can we distinguish two, two different points in it? Well, I won't, we'll try to give a complete description, but there are two very simple invariants which will be important in the discussion. One is just the number of points. Here I define the support of a divisor just to be the sub corresponding finite subset of the Riemann sphere, where we forget all about the multiplicities. Then the number of points in the support is one basic invariant. So, for example, if that's equal to the degree n, that would mean the points are all distinct. This is the most non-degenerate case. And the opposite case, where if all of the points are crowded together into one point, then this would be uh, k equals 1. Another basic invariant is the largest multiplicity which occurs. So here, in the most non-degenerate case, where the points are all different, this maximum multiplicity would be 1. And in the opposite, most degenerate case, where all the points come together, it would be n. So these are rather two, two integer invariants, both between 1 and n, but they're rather different. And one increases usually while the other decreases. Now, one very important concept that we'll be using over and over is the stabilizer of a point in the space under this action. So that's just the subgroup of G consisting of all group elements which map the point that is the divisor to itself. And the basic question, we, first basic question we have to understand is, when is this stabilizer finite? And the, there's a very simple answer here. The stabilizer is finite if and only if the support has at least three elements. And you could, I could say something more here. It's either finite or else it's a Lie group, uncountably infinite. You can't have an infinite discrete group. So there's just two possibilities. It's a finite group or a non-trivial Lie group. Well, this is easy to prove. If the uh, group acts mapping the divisor to itself, then it also must act on the underlying subset, the support. And so it will give some, and it's a, the, remember these are group elements. They're diffeomorphi diffeomorphisms, so that they must be one-to-one, -one, so that they must give a permutation of this finite set. So we have a natural map from the stabilizer to a finite group. Now suppose there are at least three points in the support. Well, the basic property of the Möbius transformation is that, or the group of Möbius transformations, is that it uh, takes any three, to three points to any other three points. So it's simply transitive on the set of three tuples of distinct points in the Riemann sphere. So if the, we have a permutation which fixes all of the, each point in the, in the support, it will fix at least three points and must be the identity, which means that the group G sub D, the, sub, the stabilizer, is, is a finite group, isomorphic to a finite group of permutations. Well, the other possibility is that we have only, at most two points in the support. So, uh, as, I, as I said, the, you can take a Möbius transformation taking any three points to any other, so we can take any two points to zero and infinity. And then we have a uh, simple uh, Möbius transformation uh, multiplication by a constant where k can be any non-zero non complex number. So in this case, the uh, stabilizer is at least the uh, group of all non multiplicative group of all non-zero complex numbers. It's a, an example of a complex Lie group. If, uh, if there's a, if there's a, 
a point interchanging zero and infinity, then there'll be one other, one other uh, element in the stable, uh, 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 more elements in the stabilizer, but it's, a Lie, it's always a Lie group. So I'll concentrate on this phase of, of uh, divisors with finite stabilizer. It's an open subset of the full group of the full projective space. And the definition I'll we'll call the moduli space for divisors under the action of the group of Mobius transformations. Well, the first statement is that this is a T1 space. By definition, this is a, means it's a space in which every point is a closed set. Or in other words, it means that the action on the space of divisors, every G space uh, of divisors with a finite stabilizer, every or orbit is a closed subset. Or another way of saying this, every if you take any limit point in the, if instead of working in DSTAB, in the things with finite stabilizer with the work in the full group of divisors, then any limit point is, must have infinite stabilizer. It's outside the space we're looking at. Well, to prove this, we have to look at elements which are close to infinity in the group G. Here, G is a non-compact group and whenever you have a non-compact group, you can put a kind of topology on it, adding a point at infinity and saying that things that are outside a large compact set are close to infinity. So we have to understand what it means for a Mobius transformation to be close to infinity, or in other words, outside of a very large compact set. Well, P1, we think of it as the Riemann sphere. It has a natural spherical metric. I look at the open epsilon neighborhood of any point, and the lemma states this. For any, given any epsilon, there's a large compact set with the following property. Any G which is close to infinity, in other words, outside this compact set, we can find two points, P and Q, such that G maps, to get, maps the epsilon neighborhood of P to something which covers everything except the epsilon neighborhood of Q. So this is a kind of picture. I've drawn, the two boxes are supposed to represent two different copies of the uh, projective of the Riemann sphere. Uh, 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 the reason for that is that P may be equal to Q or may be distinct, so would, the pictures would look very different in those cases, but if we just think of this, this is one, mapping one copy of the Riemann sphere to, the, to another, it looks clearer. So the statement is that, well, let me just explain the picture here. Uh, so everything inside the red uh, disk, inside the red loop, maps outside of the dotted red loop too. So a point here that's inside maps to a point here that's outside. Everything that's outside the red loop maps inside the red dotted loop and therefore maps inside the neighborhood of Q. Well, I won't try to prove this in detail, but here's just a, a few words to say how, how one would prove it. Uh, first of all, look at the group of diagonal transformations. So if we just think of, uh, if we identify the, uh, the uh, Riemann sphere with the complex numbers together with a point at infinity, that just amounts to setting y equal to one and looking at multiplying the x coordinate by a constant. Here x and y are complex variables. So the proof in that case is easy. Just stretching out, you can map a little disk so it covers everything except a big disk. And it's just elementary linear algebra to show that any Mobius transformation can be written as a product of a rigid rotation of the Roman Riemann sphere, followed by such a diagonal stretching, 
followed by another rotation. So now I want to prove this theorem that every, that if we have at least three distinct points, then every orbit is closed as a subset of the maps with finite stabilizer. So we choose epsilon small enough so that any two points of the support have distance at least two epsilon. Or that means that if we take any ball of radius epsilon, it can only intersect one of these uh, neighborhoods. And now we, using this epsilon, we apply the distortion limit and find two points P and Q. So we get a picture like this. So there's at most one point of our uh, divisor inside the neighborhood of P. All the others, that's the basic property that each epsilon ball contains at most one point. So everything outside of the red set will get mapped, uh, mapped into, the, uh, into the blue set. And that means that the, all but one of the points will be crowded into an epsilon neighborhood. And now, suppose that we, uh, given a sequence of points, given of, uh, so we're taking different images of the given divisor under different group elements, and suppose that this, so we're working within a given orbit, suppose that we're converging to a point D prime, just two cases, if the GI all belong in a, to a compact subset, if the GJ all belong to a compact subset, then the limit will belong, still be in the same uh, G orbit. The G, because we can choose a conversion subsequence. But if the GI are tending to infinity, then we can apply the uh, distortion lemma with epsilon going to zero, and that means that all, of the one, all but one of the points will be squashed into a smaller and smaller disk. So on the limit, there'll only be two points. One point coming, corresponding to the red disk and everything else will be squashed inside the blue disk, which is squeezing to a point. So that will prove that we, uh, that will prove that we have, uh, we've gone out of the space set of points with three, set of divisors with three distinct points and gotten into the bad set. Well, I want to look, what does this quotient space look like? It seems like a very elementary problem, which should be obvious. We just have a finite number of points on the sphere, counting multiplicities. We're allowed a very restricted group of transformations. And what does the quotient space look like? Well, the, uh, we'll first look at the, well, we, we can't look at the case where n is less than 3 because we need to have three distinct points. So the first inter possibly interesting case is n equals 3, but any three points look like any other three points after applying a Mobius transformation. So n3 is just a single point, which is certainly a well-behaved space. Now m4, four distinct points, here we get a copy of the Riemann sphere itself. And I'll just give an outline of the proof, assuming you know some classical differential geometry. Four distinct points in P1 determine a two-fold branch covering space. We take a, uh, first remove the four points, then take a two-fold covering space, and then fill in the points. We'll get a smooth torus. And Classically, this is classified by one single complex number called the J invariant. So the open subset corresponding to the divisors with four distinct points is isomorphic to the complex numbers. But there's only one other orbit to consider, an orbit with only three distinct points, and that will always be in the uh, in this G orbit, where the, here the double parentheses means the G orbit through the given divisor. So we have a divisor with two P counted twice, Q and R, and there's only one of these, 
after act, acting on the Mobius transformations. So we have a copy of C plus one extra point, and it's not hard to check that we, this just corresponds to one point compactification, which is a sphere again. So the first two cases look very easy, but from here on, it gets much worse. So theorem for n five or more, the uh, quotient space is never Hausdorff. But what we can say is that there's a maximal open subset which is Hausdorff. Now this, this is not something that's true in any, in any uh, space. For example, the toy example we considered, there was a, we had a maximal open subset which is locally Hausdorff, but it, but it wasn't Hausdorff. But in this case, there is a maximal open, open subset which is actually a Hausdorff space. And it has a simple description. It's the set of all points of n, n with multi maximum multiplicity uh, less than n over 2, where n is the degree. So it's, uh, I'm tempted to think of political or economic examples. If you too much, have too much power concentrated in one point, thing, then things get very awkward. So if half of the multiplicity is concentrated in one point or more than half, then we're in a bad situation. But as long as it's less than half, then it's OK. And now this is something which is, was completely unexpected to us. The, this quotient space is compact for even values of n, but it's non-compact for odd values of n. Uh, it turns out to be true, but uh, So in general, we also have the following. This, whether it's compact or not, it's always an orbifold of complex dimension n minus 3. This is the expected dimension. But an orbifold means that it locally looks like the quotient of a compact n minus 3 dimensional vector space by a finite group of automorphisms. So there, there are definitely singular points. These correspond exactly to the curves which have uh, I'm sorry, exactly to the divisors which have extra automorphisms. So for example, if you have a, a set of points, a random set of points in the sphere, there'll be no way of getting an automorphism which moves them. But if, say, you take the vertices of an icosahedron, this is a set of 12 points in the sphere which has a very interesting group of automorphisms, and this will correspond to an arbifold point in D12 or D stab 12, or M stab 12, I mean. And this is the best you can do. Whenever you get outside of this compact set and you have one point with at least half of the multiplicity, half of the total multiplicity, then uh, it's not even, the space is not even locally Hausdorff. Well, I won't try to prove this in detail, but just say a few words to indicate how it's proved. So first of all, there's a basic definition that an action of a Lie group on a manifold is proper if it has the following property. Given two distinct open sets, or it's usually oh, so given uh, two points, I should say, x and y and x, there are neighborhoods u and v, a neighborhood of x and a neighborhood of v, which are small enough so that the set of group elements which map some point of U to some point of V has compact closure within the group. So you can't have a situation where you can have, as you get the, uh, take the neighborhoods to be smaller and smaller, you have to go further and out, further and further out towards infinity in the group G. If that can't happen, an action is called proper, and the standard theorem is the quotient of the house to our space under a proper action is, again, a Hausdorff space. This is a fairly elementary argument, once you've understood the definitions. And using the distortion theorem, one can show that the action on the space of divisors is proper whenever this maximum of multiplicity is less than n over 2. And this is a proof which is very similar to the previous proof I gave using the distortion theorem. And a later uses similar theorem for curves, so I won't give further details. 
But now the claim is also that the space is not locally housed or uh, when we get outside this set and when we have at least degree at least five. So just to simplify things, I'll just consider the first case where n is five and I'll consider the following two divisors. D is a any divisor degree two, say two points in the finite plane, together with a point at infinity counted three times. And D prime is a divisor degree three, three points in the finite plane, plus the point at infinity counted two times. And now I look at this simple transformation. I take some, say, real large real parameter and multiply by k squared, by kappa squared, and divide by z. So we get an inversion which takes all points inside the huge sphere of or the huge uh, ball of radius kappa and multiplies it outside the sphere. So points in a large part of the, of the uh, complex plane get mapped very close to infinity. Now we just modify the definition slightly. We take uh, d2 plus g cap of d3 and d3 plus g cap of d2. And I claim these belong to the same g orbit because we do, if we just apply g sub kappa to the left side, since g kappa is an involution, it maps uh, to here. And if we multiply this by g kappa, we, by apply g kappa to this, we get d3, and apply g kappa to this, we get this. So, so these two things belong to the same orbit. Now we let kappa tend to infinity. Here, the first one, this is getting closer and closer to infinity, so we're converging to this. And this is getting closer and closer to infinity, so we're converging to this. So, so we see that the image points pi of the image of d in n5 and the image of d prime in n5 have the property that every neighborhood of one intersects every neighborhood of the other. So we have this proves that the space is not Hausdorff. And, uh, but here, d prime can be arbitrarily close to d because, oops, sorry. Because if we, uh, here we can, I don't, Oh, here, we can choose any three points in the complex plane. So uh, we can choose one of them very close to infinity, and then we'll get very close to this one. So this proves that the space is not even locally Hausdorff at that point. And the other cases of this, the proofs are very similar. OK, now I'll go on to a different, much harder subject. And I suspect that if there, there are probably algebraic geometers in the audience who will know much more about this subject than we do, but we'll be happy to uh, stand corrected if we are repeating things which are well known. Or, but in any case, we just need some definitions. Yes. Uh, an effective one cycle, uh, the point is, uh, if we just look at the space of complex curves, it's, it's a little awkward since it's non-compact. For example, if you have a curve consisting of two distinct lines, then we, we can move them together and get a, a curve consisting of a single line counted twice. So to find a, it seems more natural to work with a compact space by, by allowing multiplicities to the curves, just as we allowed multiplicities to the points in studying divisors. But it's, this is just, this, uh, you can think of it as just a kind of compactification of the space of complex curves. And again, uh, 
the same kind of argument shows that this is a structure of a complex projective space, although of a much larger dimension. So we just take a look at the set of all a non-zero homogeneous polynomials of degree n. Uh, the zero locus of this will consist of a, a, a collection of irredu irreducible curves, each counted with some multiplicity. And this is just a statement of unique factorization for polynomials and homogeneous polynomials in, uh, in three variables. So, we, so we, this gives us group space of one cycles, and then we look, look at the group of all automorphisms of the complex projective plane. This acts on P2, and hence acts on this space of compactified space of curves. And again, the stabilizer will play a fundamental role. It's just the group consisting of all projective automorphisms which map the curve to itself. And again, the stabilizer may be either finite or infinite. If it's infinite, it will always be a Lie group. So the two cases are basically different. If, if we pass to the quotient space, if we have a finite group, then the quotient space will uh, will uh, will look very much like G itself. Or, I'm sorry, the uh, the, the orbit will look very much like G itself. It's just coset space of G modulo a finite group. But if the stabilizer is infinite, then the orbit space will be lower dimensional. Just as in the toy example, we had one special point which was a lower dimensional orbit. In this case, any orbit which is lower dimensional will cause trouble, and we want to avoid it. So first of all, what is the space of curves with infinite stabilizers? There were first studied in the 19th century by Klein and Lee, who called them W curves. And there are many, it's easy to give examples. Here, I should warn you, I'm drawing pictures in the real plane, of course, but you, have to, you should think of these as being just the tr real traces of complex curves. So the simplest example is just a group of concentric circles. Clearly, you can rotate them all simultaneously. You've got an infinite group of, of transformations. Uh, the, the real picture is a little, a little deceptive because it look, makes them look uh, disjoint. But actually, if you have any two degree curves in the uh, complex projective plane, they have to have four, four intersections counting, counted with multiplicity. So that in the complex plane, these things are not disjoint, but the, you can still rotate. Here's like a simple cusp curves. They, I think. I don't know whether it's x squared equals y cubed or the other way around, but if you multiply one coordinate by t squared and the other by t cubed, it will map to itself. This is a little less obvious. This is a, we have any number of points through a common point, but one other line, which is outside of the, doesn't pass through this common point, then we can make a Möbius transformation taking this exceptional line to the line at infinity, and then we just get a picture consisting of the origin and a number of points through the origin. And then we can take like, a uniform expansion multiplying by a real constant and get an infinite group of transformations taking this to itself. Of course, this I'm describing it over the reals, but over the complex numbers, we get an infinite Oh, I'm sorry. We get a uh, a uh, complex Lie group with dimension at least one. Well, I want to look at the algebraic set consisting of all cycles with infinite stabilizer. So this is a any any algebraic set in, in a complex projective space is a union of maximal irreducible subvarieties. In, in this case, they, they're not all the same dimension, so they, they different irreducible uh, subvarieties have different dimensions, but they're, this is all uh, very well understood. You can completely classify these things and understand exactly what they are. They're 
It's a somewhat detailed list, but not, not at all difficult. So, and again, we have this property that the stabilizer is finite if and if the orbit has, has full dimension A, where A is the dimension of the, uh, of the uh, group of projective transformations of P2. So we have this fact. So whenever uh, whenever we have infinite stabilizer, then this will have dimension less than A. And for finite stabilizer, it will have dimension A. So now we can form the moduli space. This, again, we restrict the open set consisting of cycles with finite stabilizer and form the quotient space, which we'll call the moduli space for plane cycles of degree n. And, well, there are no curves with finite stabilizer of degree one or two, a line or a, a uh, quadratic curve always has lots of automorphisms. But it gets more interesting for M3. Here, the moduli space is canonically isomorphic to something we've studied already. In fact, I described M4 in terms of its relation to cubic curves. So we have, uh, in fact, this is a, we get a precise isomorphism. This is not just a topological isomorphism. It preserves complex structure. It preserves the orbifold structure. So each of these spaces has two points with extra symmetry with a larger stabilizer. I guess it's easier to describe for, for, uh, for, for, uh, divisors of degree four, you can have divisor, a divisor of degree four consisting of four points on a square, and then we have the full group of automorphisms of the square mapping this to itself. Or we can have the vertices of a tetrahedron, and then we have the full tetrahedral group with 12 elements acting on it. These correspond to uh, the elliptic curves with extra symmetries. Now, in each one, there's also one point which I'll call improper, and that the action is not locally proper there. In the case of a curve, it's a curve with a, with a uh, double point. And in the case of a divisor, it's a case of a divisor of degree four where the two points come together. And these correspond precisely to each other. If we take divisors of degree four and move it to the little points together, the corresponding cubic curves will tend towards such a singular curve. Well, that's all for the things that we re really understand. But uh, it is a theorem that this quotient space we've defined is a T1 space, points or closed sets. This is a kind of cartoon showing the, here the black, the uh, screen is supposed to represent the, uh, the set of, the set CN of all, uh, of all curves of degree N. Circle, one cycle is a degree n. We have this Wn, which is a <coughs> algebraic subvariety made of many different pieces, but it's compact and well understood. If we take any curve here, we can form its g orbit. This red line is supposed to indicate the g orbit. And the assertion is that the <coughs> closure of this orbit just consists of orbit itself plus points in, in uh, W sub n. So the boundary of the orbit is contained in W sub n. This is a theorem which I think was proved by Gazzetti in 1936 for curves and Alufi and Faber extended the proof to cycles. And uh, it's, it's not, as far, I don't know a uh, sort of a, a direct proof of this. Their, their discussion depends just on studying many, many special cases. 
which again is a, in any case, is a known, known theorem. So every point of MN is a closed set, which is not much, but it's, it's some, 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 some restriction on how bad things can be. Now, just as in the Mobius transformation, we need to make, use the distortion lemma for things which are going out towards infinity. So it's very similar. Given epsilon, there's a compact subset of this group of automorphisms of P2, which has the following property. For any G which is outside of this compact set, there are two cases. There may be a point and a line such that the G of the neighborhood of the point together with the neighborhood of the line covers the whole space so that every else, everything outside the blue disk maps into the blue uh, region around L. Or there may be the opposite situation so that uh, G maps the image of the neighborhood of L together with the neighborhood of uh, Q covers the entire space. And notice that these two cases are not really different. We can just, if, if G satisfies one, then G inverse will satisfy the other. So if we have a group element G, we also have a group element G inverse. So there's not much difference. And the proof is very similar to the proof in the previous case, just a few more details. Okay, now the next part is a lot of fun for me because it goes back to work I did about 50 years ago. So we start with the singular point of a complex curve and let n epsilon be a small round ball around it. And then we approximate the curve, the cur key, C is a singular curve. We just take any curve which is very close to it. Generically, it will be smooth. And then we take the intersection. So this is a kind of a schematic picture. We have a singular point in the curve C. We take a round ball, and which then we uh, take a smooth approximation to the curve and intersect it with the ball, we get a, a uh, compact Riemann surface with boundary. This is a one-dimensional picture, but for these, these uh, boundary points here should represent a, uh, a curve, a simple closed curve. And, oops, pressing the wrong button again. Uh, and th this boundary circle really should be a three-sphere. So in, in this case, for example, if this curve is a simple cusp, then the curve would be a trefoil knot, and we get a beautiful picture in which SP would be a surface of genus one whose boundary is the trefoil knot. Well, so I'll call the genus of this curve SP the genus of the singularity, and this is a, an object which is pretty well known. For example, we take a cusp singularity in this quite general form, x to the e equals y to the q, where p and q are relatively prime, then it's just this simple formula. So for example, for this 2, 3 cusp, we get uh, 1 times 2 over 2, which is genus 1. Or another example, suppose we take a union of smooth curve, smooth branches through a point. Then the genus is just the sum of the, of the pairwise intersection numbers minus one. So in this case, we have three different pairwise intersections. The two uh, curved, uh, curved branches have intersection number two, and the straight line has genus as intersection number one with each of them. So here this sum is one plus one plus two, subtracting one, we get a uh, genus of three. All I need, basic property, basic property for what I want to do is a monotonicity because I want to compare the genus variance for genus of different curves 
in the monotonicity property is that if we have one Riemann surface contained in another, then the genus is monotone. Well, the terminology, I don't, I'm not quite sure what terminology to use here. Riemann surface usually means a compact surface without boundary. I want to look at compact surfaces with boundary. And I want to consider the uh, case where there are many components. So I'll just, if there are k different components, I'll think of it as a union of disjoint compact Riemann surfaces with a boundary. And I suppose, this, suppose that this union is contained in another Riemann surface. Then we have this monotonicity property for the genus. And I'll leave the proof as an exercise for those who are interested. And another thing we need to know is to, how, how to compare the genera of a Riemann surface with sub Riemann surfaces. So, so, for example, suppose we start with a closed Riemann surface S with no boundary and cut it up by a number of disjoint simple closed curves. And suppose that we the result has L different components. Then the genus of the whole non-singular curve uh, genus of the whole non-singular curve is the sum of the genera of these pieces plus a correction term K is the number of boundary circles, L is the number of components of the complement, and one is a correction factor essentially coming because I'm assuming that uh, I'm assuming that this curve is closed and these are not curved, so there's an extra term of one there. And well, this, this is a, you can prove this directly or you can derive it to the corresponding formula for Euler characteristics, which is much simpler to state. Since the, since the circle has Euler characteristic zero, it doesn't contribute anything. So if we cut something along a circle, the Euler characteristic doesn't change. We just get the sum of the Euler characteristics of the pieces. And then you can translate to get that formula. Okay, so I want to do something similar to what we did for, for, uh, for the uh, case of uh, divisors and give a, find a hypothesis which implies proper action. So the difference is that now we have to consider not only lines, but also points. So for any line in any specified curve, we can do something very similar. We form the intersection of, the, of an approximating smooth curve with a closed neighborhood of the line, and we get some possibly disconnected Riemann surface with boundary. And the lemma states the following. Uh, suppose we look at the complement of this neighborhood S piece. So we have, remember, we have a smooth approximation. We, we have a small neighborhood of the point P, and we cut away this small neighborhood and look at what's left. If the genus of this is greater than the genus of the line <coughs> for every point and every line, then it follows that the action is locally proper. And with a little more work, you would find conditions for it to be proper over an open set, but let me stick to this. So this is the idea of the proof. We suppose that the action is not proper, then we can apply this distortion lemma, we'll find a point and a line so that the group element takes everything outside of the neighborhood of the point into the neighborhood of the line. Well, here we have everything outside of the neighborhood of the point, and here SL is everything in, inside the neighborhood of the line. So if this maps into this, then by the uh, distortion lemma, the, uh, this, whoops, no, but the monoticity there, the property, then this should be less than or equal to this. So if it's not, that proves, sorry, 
If it's not, that proves that the action must have been proper. Well, now we, what is this space complement of SP? <coughs> Let me call it SP star. We know that SP union SP star is the whole smooth curve. And NP intersect SP star is just a union of K circles. So if we can apply this physically based equation to get a precise description, uh, the genus of a smooth curve of degree n is classically n minus one, n minus one choose two, so that's, that is well known. L is the number of components of a component of, of, of number of components of SP plus the number of components of SP star. In most cases, that's just two. Could, in exceptional cases, it could be larger, but let me forget that possibility. And it's convenient to put the other term Add the other, add the uh, k term to the genus of p term, and define the augmented <coughs> genus to be the genus of S p plus the number of boundary curves minus one. So k is always at least one. So this is this is greater than or equal to S p. This is a very convenient invariant to use because we can apply a theorem of Mumford, which is about singularities of, of curves and conclude that this is greater than zero if and only if p is a singular point. So for example, if we just take a, a simple crossing point, that would have genus one, uh, genus zero, but two boundary curves. So g would be zero, but g plus is one. Adding in that extra term means we can detect all singularities this way. Now, just the lemma, together with the lemma on the previous slide, this formula gives us the following. Suppose the augmented genus of a point plus the genus of the line, singular, singularities along the line, is less than n minus 1 choose 2 for every p and every l. And then the action is locally proper at c, and with a little more work, we could get a criterion for being proper throughout an open set. So let me just give a simple corollary of this. Suppose we take a curve like this, which has no singularities other than simple double points and cubic cusps. So if n is greater than or equal to 4, then the action of the group of automorphisms in P2 is locally proper throughout this open set. You. In fact, with a little more work, you can prove the action is proper. So the quotient is an open subset of MN, which is a Hausdorff space. Well, that's the end of the talk proper. Let me just quickly put on a list of uh, references for anyone who wants to check further. And that's the end. Sorry? If you do the same, yes. but now a quotient to PGL2, but with ordered tuple of points, you would obtain the modelized space of, of n pointed. Um, um, well, you, you want to talk about unions of points in P2? No, no, I, I talk about the po points in P1 when you do the, when you do the, the, the quotient yes. by the PGL2 action and the divisors. If instead of um, using divisors, you use just ordered tuple of points, so P1 times P1 oh. times P1, N times divided by PGL2 in the sense that you did, okay. you would obtain M0N, the modelized space of, of um, um, genus zero curves, right, with N, 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 N markings, right, except not the stable ones, but, and then, and then, if you more, so it looks like what you're doing is dividing that by the action of the symmetric group 
up to perhaps generic um, yes. locus. So in, in particular, when you get the, the compact case, is that a quotient of M0 and bar under the, 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 the Knudsen growth and decompactification or the symmetric group? Uh, I, so what, what I, if I understand what you're saying, you, you want to choose an ordering of the points and then uh, so this will be some sort of fin finite branch covering space of what I'm looking at. Exactly. Uh, but that finite branch covering is very well known, right? Because the moduli space of genus zero goes with n point. Yeah, well, I haven't thought about this. I better not try to answer. Uh -huh. Uh, for the younger ones, um, these spaces are, they seem to be very rich, uh, a little awkward, awkward to work with, but why these actions and these uh, spaces? Is there a motivation for the younger ones to work with these specific spaces, or do you find these examples interesting for uh, uh, some reason you can explain to us? I don't have a very good answer to that. It just seems to me to be a very natural question. One is interested in curves, and if two curves are equivalent under a projective transformation, then they're essentially the same curves. So we're just studying the space of all possible distinct ways you can have a curve in D2, and this is a very rich object. It seems to me we, we want to understand it. Where this is some attempt to understand a little bit of it. I should mention that the algebraic geometers have studied this long ago. Mumford's book contains a section on this thing for hypersurfaces, but the language is very different, and I'm uh, I feel very awkward in translating what what, what we are doing to what the, what the geomet geometric invariant theory says. Let's uh, thank the speaker one more time.